if you would, open your Bibles to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 9. Mark and chapter number 9 as we continue our study in the gospel according to Mark. Remember Mark uh, wrote down, th he collaborated with Peter and uh, he wrote down uh, the uh, what we have the of the book of Mark. And so uh, Mark chapter 9 as y'all are turning in there. I uh, invite you to stand as we honor God with the reading of his word, Mark chapter 9. We're going to begin in verse number 42. Two weeks ago we concluded in verse 41. We're going to begin in verse number 42. Mark chapter 9, verse number 42. Here Jesus continues to talk with his disciples. And he says, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and were cast into the sea. And if they, er, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to in, enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, uh, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. For every one shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good. Can we get an amen? I was expecting Brother Priest to say it loudly. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltiness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. Let's pray. Father, as we are to the preaching and teaching part of the service, Lord, once again, I ask that you would empty me of myself. Father, that you would cleanse me of my sin and that you would fill me with thine Holy Spirit, that I may preach thus at the word of the Lord. Father, we are going to discuss some unpopular topics in this portion of Scripture. But Lord, I ask that, you, that we here would let the Scripture speak. Lord, that we would not harden our hearts, that we would not allow anything to buy for our time that would cause us to not to be focused, Lord, or to be drawn away from your message this morning. Lord, I ask that the Holy Spirit would be able to flow freely in this place into every heart and to every mind, Lord, convicting us of our sin Lord, may we respond at the end of this message with what the Spirit has said through the preaching of your word. Lord, have your will in your way this morning, I ask. I ask you to do these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. May God bless the reading of his word. I still have a lingering cough, and so uh, I will apologize in advance that if... Uh, begin to cough and uh, and cause a distraction. I want to speak to you, to you this morning on the subject of strong warnings from Jesus. Strong warnings from Jesus. In this portion of Scripture here, there's probably not a stronger warning for believers than what we have before us. 
And, and so I want us, as we look at these scriptures, these verses this morning, we need to hold to these scriptures. We need to dive deep into our own hearts, our own soul, and we need to make decisions because there's going to be a call to action. Listen, when we read the Bible, there are all, the, Bible we, uh, the Bible tells us there's always a call to action in our own life. And this morning, uh, the, some of the things we're going to be discussing is not going to be popular. You're not going to like it. The flesh is not going to like it because it means uh, we're going to have to put that flesh back on the cross. And so these strong warnings that Jesus has for us. He's continuing to discuss with his disciples. Remember, they've been kind of arguing back and forth a couple of weeks ago. We talked about it, how that they were arguing with one another uh, who would be first in the kingdom and, uh, and things of that nature and kind of they couldn't get it past their mind that Jesus was here to set up the kingdom uh, to deliver them from the Roman Empire. That's what they thought because they couldn't get Isaiah, what he said, out of their mind about how the government would be on his shoulders. And that was their picture of the Messiah, that Jesus, the Messiah, was going to deliver them out of bondage, but uh, we know that the bondage that Jesus was there to deliver them out of was from their sin, right? And so they couldn't get this out of their mind, and so they kept talking about uh, the kingdom of God that, that Jesus was going to set up there and then, and who was going to be first, and they were going to argue amongst each other. And uh, Listen, uh, how many of you have watched any of the series of The Chosen? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a good series. Now, remember, that's not the, the series is not Bible, right? But I, if you look at the, the, the creator of the chosen, and the, the, they have done a good job of showing the disciples how they argue with one another. And they also show Jesus is like, they see his, you, they, they portray that well in that series. And so I like how, uh, the, the what the creator did with that series and showing how the disciples uh, interact with one another and uh, and as as I said a couple of weeks ago the disciples they represent us they you know we make some of the same dumb decisions that the disciples make uh, we, it might be different because it's a different period of time but the decisions that we make are just as bad as as those decisions <coughs> and so. He, Jesus, he's getting to a point here to where he's basically telling the disciples, I'm going to step away from here, and he says, he's, uh, in my thought, he's looking at the disciples, disciples and he's teaching them, as he says there in the, in the latter part of verse uh, 48, 49 and 50, or basically 49 and 50, he's, uh, I think he's telling the disciples, you need to shut up and you need to listen to what I'm telling you. I can I, I I see this in the scripture because I, I've seen where Jesus has been exasperated with the disciples and <sighs> really and so that's what I'm seeing here and, and and Jesus listen if we look if you look at these verses in verses 42 through 48 Jesus says hell 11 times he speaks about hell 11 times and. The things we need to understand, Jesus has some statements about hell in these verses. And uh, the first thing we look at these, in these statements in, in verses uh, 43 through 48 is that uh, Jesus tells the disciples that hell is real. Listen, uh, uh, our society doesn't want to say that hell is real because if once they acknowledge hell is real then they have to acknowledge accountability our society does not want to uh, acknowledge accountability it's almost like our work everybody wants to pass the buck right that's about what happens at work it's someone else's fault well that's our society but uh, they don't want to acknowledge hell is real because then they have to acknowledge there's a creator and that, they, that God being the creator, that they're going to have accountability to him. But Jesus here, he's talking about that hell is real. And the second thing we see in those verses that Jesus states that hell is a place of torment. Do you remember about Lazarus and the rich man? 
We can go into uh, Luke there and show you how uh, everything that happened to the rich man, how uh, that, uh, the, the things that the rich man was explaining. Listen, he even says that he asked that his brothers not come to this place of torment. And so we, he, Jesus, I mean, he, he talks about the flame being quenched and the worm dieth not. He, he goes, hell is a, a place of torment. Listen, now, I've talked to a lot of, place, a lot of people, and, and I don't take them serious because they, they claim that hell is going to be one big party. Well, I'm going to tell you this right now. If you have some kind of inkling that hell is not what Jesus of the Bible tells, the, the second you open your eyes in hell, you're going to regret everything you've done on earth. You'll regret that statement that hell's just a big party. My friends are going there, so why don't I want to go? No, you do not want to go there. It is real. It is a place of torment. And the third thing we see in these verses that Jesus states is that hell lasts forever. There is no purgatory. There is no place in time, in eternity, where you get to get out of hell and go to heaven. Uh, Jesus tells us in, the, in Luke where he says there's a chasm that, that Abraham, Abraham tells the rich man, no one could come from hell to here nor here to there because of the chasm that is between. Listen, there is no escaping hell. It lasts forever. You don't want to go there. So as we see these things uh, about hell, Jesus, these statements, we need to take what Jesus says and we need to take them literally about hell. And so let's begin the message this morning. That was your introduction. Jesus, in verse 42, warns the, the disciples how they are to treat the family of God. Remember in verse 37? Look at verse, verse 37. He says, Who, Whosoever shall receive one of such children, because remember he brought a kid into the middle of him to, to teach his disciples, in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. Now we discussed this two weeks ago, how in that culture back then that children were basically almost irrelevant. They, not, they, they weren't important, right? Not, I want irrelevance, not a good word. You know, they, they weren't important enough uh, to be considered in some you know, major conversations and things of that nature. And Jesus is telling us in verse 37 that no one, no one, I have it written here, no one is insignificant in the kingdom of God. No one is insignificant. Those little, those, those babies in the nursery, they're not insignificant. And we as believers ought not to treat them insignificantly. Teenagers, you are not insignificant. You matter to the Garth Road Baptist Church. Yes, you do. You matter to me. The decisions you're making now in life matter to me because you are forming uh, some, uh, an area in your life to where the decisions you're making now are going to affect you 5, 10, 15 years from now. You're important to me. You're important to the Garth Road Baptist Church. There is no one insignificant in the kingdom of God. Hey, 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 those who are at home right now who are not able to make it to church because of physical ailments, you're important to me. You're important to the Garth Road Baptist Church. You are not insignificant. Just because you're not able to be here because physically you're having some medical problems, you matter. Miss Elizabeth and her mom, they, they know they matter to me. No one is insignificant in the kingdom of God. And so Jesus, here in verse 42, he tells us that whosoever shall offend one of these little ones. Now, he's not talking about just children. But in the eyes of Jesus, we're all little ones. We are all the, uh, those who are saved, we are all the children of God. Amen. So here he's talking about all of us. And so the disciples, how they need, he warns them how they treat the family of God. How we treat one another, he says, is how we are treating Jesus. Isn't that what he says in verse 37? 
And so, listen, he, he warns, you need to be careful how you treat those are, that are in the family of God. Jesus, again, is referring to all believers. And he says, look at this. Verse 42, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, all believers, he's saying, Who, be careful, no one is to offend anyone in the family of God. As he says here, Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. Let's talk about this word offend. We're not talking about offending as our culture talks about it today. You know what that word offend means? It means lead one to sin. So Jesus here in verse 42, he's telling his disciples, and he's telling us, because we have it in the word of God, right? You be careful that you don't lead a fellow brother or sister into sin. Because if you do, it would be better that a rope and a millstone were tied around your neck and you cast off the Fred Hartman Bridge. That's what he's saying. He says, you ought, don't lead anyone into sin. Jesus warns the disciples and us that anyone who leads another believer to sin, it is better for him to have a millstone hung around his head and cast into the sea. Jesus takes the treating of one another in the family of God very seriously. This is, a, this, is, this is some strong language from Jesus to believers. Yes, he's telling his disciples this, but we are to take this serious as believers. Right. Right? And so, if you're guilty of, a lead, of leading another believer to sin, what waits for you is worse than drowning yourself. Now, I'm not, Jesus is not saying you're going to lose your salvation, but let me help you out. The consequences that you're going to have here on earth, they're going to far, be far greater than you going out and drowning yourself. That's what he's telling us. And so, I have, a, I have a, an illustration that I want to use. I have a mirror, I have a little mirror right here, right? I have a Bible. Every time that we read the Bible or we are in a message, we are to uh, take this Bible, look in it, and take the mirror and look at ourselves. Listen, but Steve, it's awful hard to cast stones when I have a mirror and a Bible in each hand. Hello? It's a lot harder to lead someone else into sin when I'm dealing with my own sin. You get the illustration? Listen, let me tell you, let, let, let me, let me, let, can I do some meddling, Miss Charlene? Can I do some meddling? It's not about NASCAR, so don't worry about it. <laughs> Parents, when you are unfaithful to the Lord and unfaithful to his church, you are teaching your children, and it's okay to be unfaithful to Jesus. You're leading your children into sin. Hello? Parents, when you're saying, it, it, when a, a ball game, Wednesday night, and this is it's happening in Baytown on Wednesday night, soccer, baseball, football practice, gymnastics, my wife is like, I can't believe you just did that. Hey, when we miss church, miss ministering to our one another, being an encouragement to one another, 
allowing the Word of God to affect our lives because of those things out there. We are teaching our children. It's okay, and you are leading your children into sin. Oh, yeah. Well, Brother Mark, that's a little hard. I, I know it's hard. But you got a mirror in your hand? Do you have a mirror and a Bible in your hand? Listen, if, you're, if you are taking care of your sin and dealing with your sin, it's harder to lead someone else into sin. Hello? I'm thankful for a wife that will tell me. You, you, do you need to be doing that? She'll tell me straight up, do you think, listen, do you, do you think you need to be doing this? Husbands, don't lead your wife into sin. Wife, don't, wives, don't lead your husbands into sin. Because this is a very serious warning to believers. Be careful how you treat one another. Ladies, let me ask you, that friend of yours, were they gossiping before you got there? Did you lead into that gossip? Guys, did you, were, did, were, let me ask you, were your wives complaining about the pastor before you started complaining about the pastor? Hello? This is some serious, this is a serious warning. And we need to take it as such. Be careful how you treat the family of God. That's the first warning there in verse 42. Second warning in verses 43 through 48, Jesus warns the disciples on personal purity. Personal purity. Now, back in the day, medieval days, there were people taking these verses literally. They read, read these verses. You know, hand caused you to sin. Cut it off. Better for your hand to be one-handed and going to life and going to hell into the kingdom of God one-handed than it is to wind up going to hell because your hand caused you to sin. If your foot, cut it off. Your eyes, gouge it out. They were doing this. They took it literally, but what they failed to realize is they may have gouged out both eyes, they may have chopped off both hands and both feet, but the source of the sin was still there. Jesus isn't telling his disciples to literally cut them off. Let's look here as he talks about these things. These metaphors Jesus gives are to warn us on the severity of our personal sin. What is he saying in verses 43 through 48? Remove what is causing you to sin. You heard about uh, the Jeremy Renner right here lately. He's about to lose his leg, right, because of the snowplow accident. Why are the surgeons going to, to amputate his leg? Because if he doesn't, if the surgeon doesn't do that, what's causing this will hurt this. Surgeons amputate limbs because they don't want what they're having to amputate to affect or hurt the rest of the body. So the metaphor here is, listen, if whatever you're doing, is whatever's causing you to sin, cut it out. Because that right there, that little thing that may be causing you to sin, it's affecting the rest of you. It's affecting that little, that, that, this little device that you can see pornography for free and as, as abundant as you want to. Listen, if it's causing you to sin, get rid of it. 
Well, Brother Mark, I, you don't understand. Listen, I shop on Amazon. So go to Walmart, go to Kroger, go to Target. Whatever you got to do to cut it out to keep you from sinning, get rid of it. Well, Brother Mark, you, you don't understand that. That TV, it's how I, it, listen, it, it is how I relax. Well, if what you're watching is causing you to sin, get rid of it. In the words of Barney Fife, nip it in the bud. Right? So these metaphors that Jesus is given about cutting those limbs off, you need to get rid of it. Why? Because he's saying, there's coming a time. You're going to be tested, uh, disciples. There's going to become a time that you're going to be tested in. He says in verses 49 and 50, oh, yeah. So you need to prepare yourself. Folks, listen, it, we may not experience the persecution because Paul tells Timothy, all that live godly will suffer persecution, Right? We may not see the persecution in America uh, in Brother Priest's lifetime. We may not see it in some other folks here lifetime. But believe me, if they can do to the church what they did through COVID, they can do much more with a more sorriest excuse. So listen up. We, we, we need to be ready because, listen, you're not going to make it. Through the fire in verse 49, if you are not living godly. So cut it out, whatever it is. Whatever thing that is affecting the rest of your body, your, 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 your spiritual life, whatever that sin is that is affecting your spiritual life, cut it off. What Jesus is saying. Whatever keeps us from being pure, we are to remove. Jesus' war third warning. Jesus warns disciples about becoming useless. For everyone that shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good. But if it had lost its saltiness, wherewith will ye season it? They're about to go through the fire of persecution. They need to start paying attention to Jesus' teaching. Right? They've been fussing and fighting amongst themselves. Jesus is trying to prepare them for what's going to happen for the rest of their life. He says in verse 49, For everyone shall be salted with fire. He's telling the disciples, you're about to go through it. <coughs> you're about to go through it. You need to be ready. They have no idea. Listen, Matthew has no idea he's going to be killed with a sword. Mark has no idea that he's going to be drugged by, behind by horses and die. Luke has no idea he's going to be hung. John has no idea that he's going to be boiled in oil and sent to the Isle of Patmos. Peter had no idea that he was going to be crucified upside down. James didn't have a clue that he was going to be thrown off the temple roof and killed. James, the son of Zebedee, he had no idea he was going to be beheaded. Bartholomew knew, didn't know he was going to be filleted alive with the whip. Andrew didn't know he was going to be crucified. And Thomas had no idea he was going to be stabbed with a spear. And Jude being shot with arrows. They had no idea what their, how they were going to die or what was ahead of him. But Jesus says, you will be tried by fire. Be ready. Be ready. Folks, we, we don't know anything about that in America today, but it's coming. It's coming. It's happening all over the world. Listen, even in Mexico, Catholic priests are killing missionaries because the missionaries are trying to come to these villages to share the truth of the gospel, and these priests are killing them. Yes. In North America, Mexico is happening. Folks, it's not here yet, but it's coming. 
Are you ready for, to be tried by fire? Jesus says, keep yourself salty. Now, he's not saying be negative, right? We use the word salty as someone may be negative. They're, well, they're just salty because their team lost. Right? We'll use it. No, no, no. Jesus is not talking about that. See, back then, their salt that they had would lose flavor. I like flavor on my food. Right? Salt is good, Brother Priest. Brother, Brother Lee was here. He would jump for joy. He loved. I don't remember how many times in the past. Well, I had a meal with Brother Lee here. And he would just cake that salt on. Salt is good. But if it's lost its flavor, why would you? Hello? Do we put things on food that don't have flavor? Why? We, we put things on the food that have flavor so they taste better, right? Well, Jesus says, stay salty. Hey, folks, believers, don't get so involved in the world that leads you to sin that you become ineffective. That you've lost your seasoning. Because the more we get involved in this world, the more it, le it will lead us to sin. Sin, personal sin in our life, will cause us as believers to be ineffective for the cause of the gospel. Brother Jack, that's what we're to do, right? We're to share the gospel. And if we are so involved in this world that we've lost our saltiness, who are you going to be able to lead to Christ? Who's going to want what you have? Right? Who wants to put just a bunch of white things on your food that doesn't affect your food? That doesn't make your food better? Folks, he, Jesus here is telling us to stay salty. Be effective. Don't become useless. And I want to say this. For those of you that may not be able to do what you used to do, you can still be effective. Just because you can't walk and hand out tracts on Saturday morning like you used to, just because you're not able to do the things that you were able to do once does not mean you're useless. You can encourage one another by just being here. You can pray. Hello? You can beseech the Lord on the behalf of your church, on the behalf of your pastor, and on the behalf of those that are, we are, try, that are lost that we are trying to reach. Say, so you may not be here on the Baytown Love Ministry handing out food, but if you can be praying Saturday morning, that who, the, 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 the law, those that come on Saturday morning before they get food, as they hear the gospel message, that if they receive the free gift of salvation, you can pray. Jesus warns his disciples and us as believers, don't become useless. The disciples need to hear and listen to Jesus' teaching, and so do we. These warnings, these three warnings that I've pointed out this morning, how are you going to respond to Jesus' warnings? How are you treating others in the family of God? Listen, there's only one perfect church and one perfect pastor, and it's going to be in heaven when we see it. You're, listen, if you're expecting the Garth Road Baptist Church to be the perfect church, we're not. Now, I'm not trying to give an excuse. If you're looking for the perfect pastor, I ain't him. As we say in Texas, I ain't him. You know, Judas had the perfect pastor, and he still did what he did. So don't blame your pastor, your church, on your 
what's going on? That's just, that's just free help right there. How are you treating church? How are you treating the rest of the church? I'm not talking about the building. This is not the church. This, this property is not the church. We're the church, right? How are you treating one another? Listen, we're family. We are going to hurt one another, right? We're going to say some things. That might hurt somebody's feelings. But you better get it right because the way you treat others, Jesus says, that's how you're treating me. Second warning, how's your purity? How is that mirror looking? How, how are you looking in the mirror of the word of God? Are you dealing with your sin? Are you trying to deal with the sin of others? Because you're perfect. No. Keep looking in that mirror. Keep looking to the word of God to deal with your sin. Number three. As Jesus tells his disciples, are you salty? How's your flavor? At work. Are you, are you participating in those jokes? Are you participating in the same language that they're using at work? How's your, how's your saltiness? Let me ask you this. Are you effective in the Great Commission? Well, I don't go because who would listen to me? Well, if you're, and if you, listen, if you're so involved in the world, who, I, I see why people wouldn't want what you have. All right, how's your saltiness? Have you lost your flavor? Listen, if, if, if you see yourself in every one of these warnings that Jesus is giving us here, Listen, we here at the DeCarthur Baptist Church, we still have an altar. Jesus, listen, God is a God of second, third, fourth, hundredth, thousandth, millionth chances. Check your pulse. Are you alive? If you're alive, you can still get right. You can still get right. Will you take the opportunity if the Spirit of God, by the preaching of His Word, has convicted you of anything in your life this morning, you need to make it to the altar and get things right. Become more, but get, get your saltiness back. Deal with your purity. Cut things off. Make a decision. 